Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show, I'm your host Paul, and this video we're breaking down Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back. Released back in 1980, this changed the movie industry for the several decades that followed it. It's almost become a catchphrase to describe the darkest chapter in a franchise it's being its quote unquote Empire Strikes Back and there's a lot going on with this movie that's made its legacy so impactful. Search your feelings, you know it to be true. But what makes it so special and why has it got such a big legacy? Well throughout this video we're going to be breaking it all down and going over the making of its easter eggs and the thematic elements that make it a masterpiece. Subscribe you will and thumbs up button hit for videos like this every single week. Without the way, huge thank you for clicking this. Now let's get into The Empire Strikes Back. The Empire Strikes Back. Now A New Hope came as a massive surprise to everyone, most notably George Lucas. Expecting it to be a bomb, he didn't even go to the premiere and instead he vacationed with Steven Spielberg whilst the movie was being shown. Whilst the pair were away though, they came up with the idea for Indiana Jones and George felt like this next project might save his reputation. However, as we know, Star Wars was an incredible phenomenon and after it blew up the box office, it also achieved a Best Picture nomination. Star Wars earned more money than any other movie had ever made in history and thus a sequel was quickly put into production. Now if you checked out our last video, then you'll know how stressed out Lucas was when he was making that first film. It had a severe impact on his health and he knew that a sequel was going to have to be bigger and better. If he made the movie, he'd have to work out the finances, run the production company and also be there every day directing it. This would undoubtedly lead to a much bigger toll and thus he decided to put things in place to take a step back whilst overseeing the production. Lucas actually toyed with selling the rights to the sequels off to 20th Century Fox but in the end he felt like it couldn't be entrusted with others, which yeah, moving on. Now using the 12 million he made from A New Hope, he decided to put that money into his production company ILM and he also set up Skywalker Movie Ranch out in California. Taking out a bank loan, he also self-financed the film and went for a budget of $25 million which was double the first movie. Written by Hurley from Lost, Lucas worked away in his ranch on the screenplay whilst concept art was created for completely alien locations that were the opposite of the first film. Lucas wanted to do more than just rehash that movie so he had Luke training as a Jedi and also a romance between Han and Leia. Now Lucas originally offered the director's job to David Lynch but he turned it down due to his surrealist style not matching with Lucas's vision. Lynch later went on to make 1984's Tune which though I enjoy was a pretty major flop. Now taking his old teacher Irving Kirshner to lunch he pitched him the idea but this was initially turned down. And I said gee George. I don't think so. Kirshner was someone who was known for small character driven indie films but this is why he felt that he'd be perfect for the role. Convinced by his agent he then got to work and the crew created 60 sets which vastly outweighed the first film. Although this movie it, it was going to be big and bombastic, it was very much a character piece that would see the heroes at their lowest points. Now to me this has always been the appeal of Empire and Lucas went through numerous idea changes when putting it all together. He wanted to include the Emperor in a big bad way but he also had to explain how Mark Hamill had suffered facial injuries. Hamill actually got into a very serious car accident just after filming the first movie and this actually left Lucas unable to reshoot parts of it. Lucas had apparently told them that had he died then they would have recast him and then focused his story on Luke's long lost sister. You can kind of see how that would play into the future and Hamill apparently got told at one point that his sister was in fact Leia. Now they ended up explaining the slight change in Hamill's appearance through the Wampa attack as the surgery adjusted his face a bit from how it looked in the first film. He got a fractured nose and also a cheekbone but to be honest I never really noticed the difference and yeah let me know if, if you picked up on it. I'm sure you've heard the rumours though about them purposely shooting that scene to explain the scars but at the time most of them had healed up. That whole story is a bit of bantha poodoo and the scene would have been in the film anyway as they needed a way to have Obi-Wan return to tell him to go to Dagobah. Now these scenes were all shot without them actually knowing if Alec Guinness would return and had he not then they would have been completely f***ed. Hello there. Now Lucas actually hired science fiction writer Lee Bracker to help punch up the dialogue and they worked away and came up with the core ideas. Firstly there'd be something on the Wookiee homeworld, the Emperor, a gambler from Han's past, a frog-like creature and someone called Minch Yoda. 
The name Yoda was taken from the Sanskrit word Yodha, which translates to English to mean warrior. Now after some changes, there was a city in the cloud added, the snow planet Hoth and a chase through an asteroid belt. There was also a battle between Luke and Vader, and originally they wanted the ghost of Anakin to visit his son and be accompanied by Obi-Wan. Now this is where stuff starts to differ, and it was from here that things diverted off completely. Han was going to go on to recruit his powerful stepfather, and Lando was going to be revealed to be a clone from the Clone Wars. Lucas made notes and tried to reach out to Brackett, but she sadly was hospitalised and died of cancer just a few weeks later. Now because of this, Lucas's hands were tied, and after bringing Lawrence Kasdan on, they then reworked the script. Actually enjoying the process this time, Lucas made changes based off her work, but in the end he struggled to close out the third act. Instead he flirted with the idea of dropping Invader's castle and his fear of the Emperor which gets brought across the main film. Vader's big thing is of course trying to get his son to join him and he very much gives away that they can rule a galaxy together. That would be without the Emperor and there was plans in place that the pair would join up and then fight him together. Join me and together we can rule the galaxy as father and son. Now bounty hunters were also brought in to track down Luke and at this point they started conceptualising Boba Fett. He was going to be based on the man with no name and this is actually why the sands of spurs are used when he's on screen. Introduced in the Star Wars Holiday Special, there were also plans at one point to give him an all white costume. Lucas testing this out can be seen in certain images with the idea being that he could be named the Super Stormtrooper. He also bring across the scalp of a Wookiee which Jeremy Bullock kept brushing out of the way because he thought it was a dislodged hairpiece. This is all discussed in his autobiography Flying Solo, not lying, where he talked about how he also played an Imperial in the movie who drags Leia out the way. The actor who was supposed to play him didn't end up showing up and thus Bullock stepped out of the costume to play this minor part. Imagine right, all the bragging rights and the work that guy could have got off the back of being an Empire and he, li he literally had one job and, and couldn't even do that. A Fett does appear in the special edition of A New Hope when Han meets Jabba, but it's important to bear in mind that that was added in with CGI. On Brackett's draft, she also had Obi-Wan telling Luke to leave his training, whereas Lucas felt it gave Luke more agency to decide to do it himself. The scene in the cave with a vision of Vader was also reworked too, and originally Luke's flirting with the dark side was shown completely differently. Luke was going to Wally massacre stormtroopers, which somewhat got reused down the line when Anakin murdered the Tusken Raiders. I killed them. I killed them all. And not just the men, but the women and the children too. Alright mate, calm, calm down, calm down. I hate them! Now, titling it The Empire Strikes Back, Minch Yoda was reworked to well, he guessed it, uh, and originally this was going to be a slimy swamp creature. He was supposed to show Luke to not judge a book by its cover, with them eventually combining him with a frog like creature planned in the original outline. Stuart Freeborn designed him, and, and I tell you, when, when you see him in this video, mate, you're going to instantly recognise the resemblance. Joel showed me a few original sketches, and uh, I thought, well, that's interesting, but uh, I want something in more depth, you see. And so I looked in the mirror and I thought, well, uh, something perhaps a little bit amusing about my face. So I modeled something of myself. Now I've got to make him look intelligent. I got this photograph of Einstein and put the Einstein wrinkles in all around. I did a lot of thinking about it because he's got to be full of subtle action and movements especially in the face and the body, and uh, put it all in what was necessary, and then finally it all worked. Now Frank Oz really struggled with it because uh, until this point there'd never been a movie done at this scale with a realistic character portrayed by a puppet. They also had sound issues with Hamill being unable to hear Yoda's voice because Frank Oz had to be several feet below the set. They had to use earpieces which they covered with his hair, but in the end that even caused issues itself. I had an earpiece where I could hear, oh, many years have you ever... And then if you turned your head the wrong way, you'd pick up Radio 1 and it was the Rolling Stones singing Fool to Cry. Lucas said the entire movie either lived or died on Yoda, and it's kind of a miracle that they managed to get it right. Too old to begin the training. I'm not afraid. Oh. You will be. You will be. Sorry. Uh, 
Um, no problems. Snakes on the set also caused trouble too, with one even biting Hamill at one point. I'm tired of these motherfucking snakes on this motherfucking set. And beyond that, Hamill got really, really annoyed. According to IMDb trivia, he had to bang his head 16 times on Yoda's hut before Kirshner finally got the reaction he was after. And from what I've heard, the guy was completely miserable on set. He was the only actor on the call sheet for 99% of these parts, and he spent a lot of the movie on his own, away from the other actors. Now Frank Oz originally wasn't supposed to provide Yoda's voice, but Lucas ended up enjoying the performance, and thus he stuck with it. Lucas actually pushed for Oz to get a Best Supporting Actor Oscar, but they ultimately rejected it because he was just puppeteering. Ironically, he voiced Kermit the Frog and Ms. Piggy, and when they were designing Yoda, Lucas said he saw the creature as being their illegitimate child. Now the voice thing is similar to what happened with C-3PO in the first film, with Anthony Daniels also winning Lucas Round. Now out of the whole cast, only Hamill and Fisher were signed on for sequels, with Ford refusing to do a multi-picture deal due to bad experiences in the past. He actually wanted his character to get killed off, and the reason he was frozen in Carbonite was because they genuinely didn't know whether he'd do a third film. Lucas of course refused to R.I. Kilhorn, and he promised Ford a much bigger heroic part for that third film. David Prowse was also very apprehensive too, with him feeling like he was more of just a prop rather than being an actual performer. Prowse's voice was of course replaced by James Earl Jones, but fearing they might recast if he refused, he ended up signing on. Earl Jones actually felt bad for taking money for his work in the movie, and he apparently refused to be credited when the film was first released. He also only accepted $15,000 pay for what he saw as being just a couple of hours in a recording booth. Alec Guinness was someone who also didn't take a salary and instead he got 0.25% of the film's final gross. Due to his failing eyesight, he only worked a couple of hours on set and this was seen as a way that both sides could win. This is of course a similar deal to what he had on A New Hope, but even a 0.25% ownership of this led to big bucks. In the end, Guinness earned over $100 million, which is equivalent to about $370 million today. Hello there. Now as always, the production was plagued with problems too, and though they had space booked out at Elstree Studios, this clashed with the filming of The Shining. That took up most of the space there, and the Star Wars team were forced to give up two stages so that they could then film. They actually pulled across some of the snow sets from that movie though, and a couple of moments on Hearth are pieces from that film. Poor weather delayed the construction though, and this was also seen in Norway where they filmed some of the Hoth scenes. Getting hit with the worst snowstorm in half a century, the production was blasted with blizzards and 40 mile an hour winds. Camera lenses iced over and paint froze in its tin, making everything even more difficult than it was shooting on Tatooine. Now, being shot in Norway, little, little bit of heavy spoilers trivia, our own Simon A. Berman who helped us out on our Bad Batch videos, his godfather Ian Liston actually played Wes Jensen. Simon actually helps make movies out of Norway and he's massively helped out this channel, so it was really cool getting hit with this extra bit of heavy spoilers history. Now being a Jedi is all about patience and mindfulness. That's why this video is sponsored by BetterHelp to bring you this brilliant deal with our online therapy sessions. I haven't really talked about this much on the channel before, but back in 2019, I actually got diagnosed with anxiety, which made a lot of things in my life suddenly make sense. I'd always be stressed out and worried about things, um, and I used to panic if I was late or if I fell behind on a deadline. Just talking about it has really helped me to deal with it without medication and I feel a thousand times better than I did just a couple of years ago. Now regardless, if you have a clinical mental issue like depression or anxiety, or if you're just a human who's going through a tough time in life right now, because le let's be honest, the world's a bit all over the place at the moment, therapy can give you the tools to approach your life in a completely different way. BetterHelp easy helps you find a therapist and it can match you with the right one for you. Working online through an app, BetterHelp allows sessions to be remote and means that you can balance it around your life. Signing up is easy too and you can get matched with a therapist in just a couple of days. The link in the description right now will take you to betterhelp.com slash heavy spoilers and it's going to give you 10% off your very first month. It's a perfect time to try it out, get connected and see if therapy can help you out. They also easily allow you to change your therapist if you don't feel like things are working out so you can find the one that's the right fit for you. At no additional cost, you can swap your therapist and go with someone else if you feel you've gained everything that you need to. If you've ever been curious about therapy or have tried it in the past, then this is the perfect opportunity to take it up and see if it can change your life. Again, go to betterhelp.com slash heavy spoilers and get 10% off your first month.
That's betterhelp.com slash heavy spoilers and get that 10% off your very first month. Huge thank you to BetterHelp for supporting the channel and thank you everyone who checks that deal out. Peace. Now that takes us into the movie itself, which begins with the text of episode 5 in the classic title crawl. Back in 1977, A New Hope didn't actually come with that name, and instead the movie was just titled Star Wars. Adding this in gave the idea that it was a grander story, and upon re-releases Lucas then added in the episode 4 and New Hope titling. Now I don't know if it's just me, but watching the 4K Blu-ray on my OLED really made the space scenes pop this week, with the stars burning and blinking in the background, and made making that title crawl really stand out. Beginning with the text, it's a dark time for the rebellion, this instantly lets us know the tone for the film, and that'll be taking things down to its lowest point. The movie actually bummed a lot of people out upon its release, and it received quite a few negative reviews for where it took the characters. You can kind of see why, as the first movie was so beat, and it started the grand tradition of people complaining about Star Wars. No one hates Star Wars more than Star Wars fans, and Lucas actually issued an apology for how it made people feel. After cutting to the Imperials, we once more see a Star Destroyer and watch his probe droids ascend searching for Skywalker. Like bugs descending and spreading out, we learn the Empire sent thousands of these across the galaxy, desperately hunting for him. The idea of them being like insect bug things is of course carried across to their design, with the appearance of them even appearing spider-like due to all the eyes. Whereas, I know it's an arachnid yet, but whereas the first film tried to do the comedic duo of 3PO and R2 to start the film, this probe droid has a far more sinister side to it. If you read the transcripts, you can actually figure out what it's saying, and the line apparently is, Scan into the system, I can see the rebel base. Now the probe going to Hoth echoes the shot in a new hope of the escape pod crashing down on Tatooine. This gives us the idea this movie will be an opposite of the first as that had a hot desert planet whereas this is a barren Iceland. You should have called it Colt. Ah, ah, he said it, he said it. Anyway, NASA actually have a planet on their radar that they've nicknamed Hoth which is a super earth planet orbiting a sun 3000 light years away. Now in the intro we actually get two things crashing down with the first probe landing before we cut to Luke riding a Tauntaun. Luke sees another thing come crashing down, and this has always made me wonder whether this is two probes, or if it's the same one. The screenplay actually clears it up, with it stating that we see it before we cut to Luke's perspective of the exact same event. Personally, yeah, Steven Spielberg over here, I probably would have just done the one, but I guess it, it would have been weird to show the probe droid hatching in between these moments before we then get the one per attack. The Tauntauns were originally designed to look lizard-like, but due to how cold it was, the creative team made them carry across sheep qualities to keep them warm. When crafting the creatures, they looked at a lot of different designs, with them originally settling on the beast that the Necron 99 rode in in the 1970s film Wizards. Now at this point, Luke gets attacked by the Wampa, who itself was based on the Abominable Snowman. Is it abomina Abominable? Now filming with these creatures was a complete nightmare and Lucas ended up having to cut around a lot of them due to how bad they looked on camera. For the special edition they went back and reshot several moments with them, including the cave scene which was originally completely absent of the moments where it's crouched down eating something. <laughs> They made a much smaller set for this so that the Wampa would seem bigger, with ILM's Howie Weed playing the part of the creature. Lucas originally only wanted to do a special edition version of A New Hope, but they saw the benefits of re-releasing these movies due to the big bucks they got back on them. However, he was kind of pushed time-wise to get the other ones done, which is why Balthus and Jedi have fewer changes in them. Now Wampas were going to play a much bigger part, and originally there were going to be some lines of dialogue where we discover that they'd attacked Echo Base. At one point when Han's walking to find out about Luke, you can catch a dead one on the ground and this was supposed to be in the aftermath of one of their ambushes. There was also a deleted scene involving Wampas trapped in a room, which C-3PO would use as a way to trick some of the snowtroopers. Now Luke hanging upside down is a motif that repeats throughout the movie and it always comes at transformative points in his life. 
The first time here's him reaching out and using the force to pull his lightsaber, which is the first time we'd seen something like this in the saga. This then leads to Ben speaking directly to him, and this is so he can move on to the next part of his training. That involves Yoda with him doing an upside down handstand and once more having to tap into the force as part of that training. The last time comes after he learns Vader is his father and he hangs upside down underneath Cloud City. In order to escape this he has to use the force to speak to Leia and again it's sort of like poetry they rhyme. Now Luke's costume here also highlights his changing with it being a mix between grey and white. This is something that we see evolve throughout the original trilogy with a character wearing all white in that very first movie. Come the end of this it's shifted to fully grey with Jedi being where he ends up donning all black. It's a really good progression of his colour scheme and it also hints to the audience that he loses the innocence he's once had. Now cutting off the one bazaar, this neatly foreshadows his hand being lost and it slips in the idea that lightsabers can do this. I know that it happened with Obi-Wan in the last movie but they're really hammering at home here so it fits in with the end. Now when Luke escapes we watch him run out into a blizzard which was a real one happening in the area. The crew talked about how they all huddled in huts whilst Hamill had to do this and they taunt taunted him about him freezing his nuts off. Now at Echo Base we hear Solo mentioning Jabba the Hutt and also the bounty hunter Arnold Mantell. I thought you would decided to stay. Well the bounty hunter we ran into when Lord Mandel changed my mind. This is somewhere that you visit in Shadows of the Empire with Dash Render riding on the back of a train to take him to the central part of the junkyard. Upon arriving there you face off against IG-88 which was clearly riffing on this line from Empire. The story with the group running into a bounty hunter would later be explained with a radio show titled Rebel Mission to Ord Mantell. This dropped in 1983 and it featured most of the original cast and retold this story. We actually get a bit of a clue to the rivalry between the bounty hunters later on and you can actually catch what looks like IG-88 on Cloud City. In the room where the Ugnaughts are dismantling the droid, if you look just by the furnace you, you can actually see the machine lying there. Now in the expanded lore, it was explained that IG-88 arrived at Cloud City Tailing Fair which is when the pair duked it out with the latter winning. However, there's conflicting reports over this with it also being said to be IG-86. In Shadows of the Empire, Dash actually destroys 88 so yeah, you can kind of pick your poison with that and decide who this body is for you. Now we also get the romance between Han and Leia which is played up a ton throughout this entire movie. Canonically this is set 3 years after the first film and Lucas wanted to put these characters together which is why they barely share scenes with Luke. There is still that whole thing with the kiss though which will just chalk up to being based on Greek myths. To be fair neither knew that they were related and it does kind of push Han and Leia to accept that they like each other. Now Carrie Fisher actually stood in a box for a lot of her scenes with Ford cause it turned out he was an entire foot taller than her. I love Han's moments where he's getting annoyed by Chewie because they just want to leave and though he, he's wanting to sort things out with Jabba, the mood changes when he learns Luke's missing. You really get the friendship that these people have built between the movies with Han genuinely worried that Luke's out on his own. I'm not sure what the whole idea of hell in this universe is based around but even Han saying this just uh, it really hits home. Then I'll see you in hell. Yeah. It lets you know that he's willing to risk it all and just that scene where the door closes it adds so much with Chewie's agonizing cry showing how much he cares about the character. <coughs> now before it goes down we get two of the rebels discussing that they've had no word and on the right's John Ratzenberger who played Cliff in Cheers. Not really much of an easter egg but Obi-Wan delivers his message and I've always thought it was so cool how Han appeared behind him. I don't know if Obi-Wan in the blizzard was what drew him to Luke or if he just dropped the message because he knew he was coming but it's such a great transition from one character to the other. I doubt it's because Han sees him but you know we try and look at it from all angles though he probably would have seen the ghost in the Jedi if he could see ghosts. Either way he also busts out Luke's lightsaber and as a kid I always remember playing as him and doing like the odd thing with it because I thought Han at least still could smash about with one if the situation called for it. Now I always liked the idea that Han saved Luke from getting frozen but in the end Luke failed to return the favour. Both are encased in something that keeps them alive but one goes off to a darker fate whereas the other doesn't. Han manages to save Luke using the old survival trick of sleeping in an animal's innards and this was something that they also showed in the Revenant. Now one touch of Lucas did was the colour of Han's coat as this basically became the first blue or gold dress. Back in the day the toys had a blue coat whereas some people swore that it was brown in the film. 
For the special editions, they turned up the blue hue to match the toys, because that's the main thing that people tend to remember. Nice bit of trivia for you there, and the next day we see the snow speeders heading out and are introduced to Rogue Two. Commander Skywalker, do you copy? This is Rogue Two. This would of course go on to influence the name Rogue Squadron and also Rogue One, which centered around the Rebels. Little, little bit of cheeky costume design here, but you can catch bubble wraps on the shoulder straps that he's riding around with. Now Luke is placed in a Bacta tank, and these have been laced throughout the saga with, with don't get me started on Book of Boba Fett makers, like every every time something got interesting, it just go back to the tank. Now Gareth Edwards also had one appear in Rogue One, and Obi-Wan later used it to reintroduce Vader with those scenes riffing on his son here. Again, I will be talking about how some of these moments pay off in the other movies down the line, as it's unlikely I'll ever cover them in depth or, or talk about them on a breakdown. I know it does some of you guys head in when I mention stuff like The Last Jedi, but I'll try and keep it to a minimum as we go through the breakdown. Now Han tells Luke, You don't look so bad to me. <laughs> he looks strong enough to pull ears off a gun dart. <laughs> Which is a giant Rancor-like beast that comes from the planet Vancor. Now obviously you guys know, yeah, I just have to put a disclaimer in, this movie was shot in 1980, so some of the elements are a little bit dated. They're they're a little bit problematic, shall we say, and Leia calls Han a nerf herder at one point, which, uh, look, I apologise if you're watching this, we just have to use the word in context to explain what she meant. Now, a nerf herder was someone who herded nerfs, and this was seen as a lower class profession that didn't require any skills or competence. This became an insult throughout the galaxy, though I'll, I'll, I've never used that word in my entire life, I've never even thought it, and I've definitely never said it when I've wrapped along with a, a song on the radio. Now after picking up the probe droid, we also get this line. Ten roads, ten and eleven to station three eight. Which is a reference to George Lucas' film THX 1138. This was also dropped in A New Hope. Cell block 1138. Showing that it's all connected. Now after destroying the probe, we cut to Star Destroyers in space and literally see how they're overshadowed by Vader's new vessel. The Super Star Destroyer completely engulfs all, and one of its hyperdrive engines recently popped up in Ahsoka. We've actually just launched a new Ahsoka inspired t-shirt just below on the merch store right under the video, and every sale helps you look slick and helps videos like this get made. Make sure you send us pictures of you rocking it on Twitter as well, and we can drop them in the videos as a big thank you to say, you know what, we appreciate your support. Now accompanying this is Vader's Imperial March, which was based on the planet's Mars bringer of war. I love the bickering between the officers and Vader just calmly shutting down any of the descent. Just something so, I don't know, militaristic about the whole thing and even his spin to catch a guy standing very close behind him, it's just like everyone's fixated on what he says. Now we get a cameo back at Echo Base with concept artist Ralph McQuarrie walking through a scene. In his hand he's holding a sketchbook and according to the legends this contains his original drawings. We can also see Han fixing up the Falcon and can catch a periscope droid which appeared in A New Hope. This is actually a final farewell between Luke and Han, and they wouldn't actually see each other again until Return of the Jedi. Back on the ship we see as Vader force chokes Admiral Ozzel, calling back to him doing it to Krennic in the first movie. Kinda, I kinda smirked watching this back, you know, seeing Ozzel slowly die while Vader just keeps barking orders, and nobody around Ozzy tries to step in and help him out. Kinda shows how Imperials aren't exactly bothered about labour laws, but we actually get a really subtle detail that builds off this scene. Piet is promoted from Captain to Admiral, and later on the characters got a slightly extended badge. Now at this point the Adats arrive, with them being designed and filmed in stop motion by Phil Tippett. According to Tippett, he based them off the alien walkers in War of the Worlds, and also on gantry cranes which land ship docks. Studying elephants, they wanted their movement as realistic as possible, and they're some of the most memorable things that we encounter in this film. A little cool thing they do is that when they target the shield generator, we can actually see the blaster bolt way bigger than the standard shots. Now suddenly, Lucas lets us know that the rebels are screwed here, as the first thing we see them do is evacuating the planet. The entire speeder scene is simply to buy them time, and rather than being like a heroic battle from the first film, their only interests escaping. Now I do, poop on, I do poop on the special editions a bit, but one thing it allowed them to do in these moments was tidy up the effects. Originally the mat on the ships and walkers wasn't as developed as it is now and you could actually see them through the parts of the cockpit. They cleaned this up for the re-releases with transparency now being completely removed, but if you had the, 
the old special edition VHS, and you'll know they discussed it on that. Luckily for you, if you don't have it, I actually dug out the old tape, but a warning, yeah, some of these clips may be in 480p. A challenge when we did it, because nobody had ever done uh, blue screen matting on a white surface. You usually do it on dark surfaces. Here we go, then. Action! <laughs> We used optical technology, of course, to, to do all that compositing. And a telltale sign that something's been optically composited is a black line around it. And when you have a sequence that takes place in outer space against stars, it's easy to reach a point where those black lines don't show up. But when you have a sequence that takes place against snow in the daylight, every hint of that that black mat line becomes very visible. And so the first time through doing the doing the snow battle here uh, 17 years ago, a lot of effort went into finding ways to minimize that black line. One of the ways was to not print all of the elements at their full opacity. All right, I'm coming in. Consequently, when you see the snow battle on film, you may notice that there's part of the, the scenery is visible through the cockpit. And it was a constant trade-off of how transparent can we make the cockpit? At what point is the black line more objectionable than the transparency? And so there was uh, an opportunity to go back into those shots, use the computer technology, and eliminate all the transparency, but also not have any matte lines. Now, during this attack, we also get our first Wilhelm scream, which is something that appears throughout almost every movie. We also meet Luke's co-pilot, Dak, who always felt like he was brought in so they could just kill him for this battle. He's actually named after editor Dwayne Dunham's dog, Dak, and this brings a sort of biplane aesthetic to the ships. Dennis Lawson also returns after fan interest due to him being one of the only survivors from the Death Star mission. Now I'm sure you know, but just in case you don't, Lawson's actually Hugh McGregor's uncle, who of course played Obi-Wan. Now all the scenes involving explosions with them, such as when Luke throws a thermal detonator under one and the down one blows up, they had to be shot using different techniques. Due to them being miniatures, they had to be filmed on high-speed cameras, which were then slowed down to make the tiny explosions look big. Also, I know there's some back and forth on the pronunciation of whether it's at at or eighty eighty, with Lucas saying it's in fact pronounced at at. I don't think they care though, because like loads of these names get pronounced differently, even from scene to scene. Han gets called Han. I actually call him Han, but I've been purposely calling him Han throughout the video just to avoid comments. And Donald Glover actually made a joke about this during the movie Solo. Billy D. Williams accidentally called him Han, and no one corrected it. So Glover did the same thing in Solo, which Han then corrected. They also have a moment where Billy D. Williams calls him Han, and you can tell it throws everyone off in the scene because they all start doing the same thing. Han, it sounds like Han. Let's do it just to save Han. Now the accents in general, they tend to decide how something's said, and it was actually during this movie that Kirshner made sure to make the sides have distinctive ones. In A New Hope, Leia has a more British sounding voice, but Carrie in this movie leans into her actual one. Kirshner made sure to have all the rebels speaking American and all of the Imperials speaking with a British accent. This was done to make the story an analogue to the American Revolution and even though a lot of the actors in the hot scenes were British, they actually ended up redubbing a lot of the actors to keep up this consistency. You can spot this when the guy sees the ad ad and his mouth doesn't move along with what he's saying. Echo Station 3TA. Echo Station 3TA. Echo Station 3TA. Now amongst the adats, we can also spot ATSTs, which, you know, looking back, maybe it should be pronounced AT80. Either way, they play a much bigger role in the follow up film, and Lucas actually filmed more scenes involving them just for this movie. However, he found the adats were far more menacing, realizing the smaller ones would be better for close quarters combat. After Dak dies, we get a really heroic moment with Luke, where he shows he's capable of taking down an AT80 single handedly. I'm just going to call them AT80s because uh, that's what I feel I should do. And from now on, I'm also calling him Han. Don't boo, don't boo. Boo this man! <laughs> now using his lightsaber, he busts one up, and it shows how skilled that he's becoming as a fighter. We also get a moment where a walker shoots down a speeder, and I just love the stop motion here where it tilts and takes it out. It looks really cool, and it also changes the tone of the scene to give the Imperials the upper hand. 
The shield generator is destroyed and we then cut back to the base where we see Han and Co desperately racing to the Falcon. The snow troopers storm in and the uniforms are actually based around German troopers who were sent to the front lines to fight the war with Russia. Might be a reach but I always felt they looked like KKK cloaks as well with the point being removed from the top of their heads. Either way Han busts out one of the Falcon's surprises with a gun dropping down from underneath the ship. This was later riffed on in The Force Awakens with us getting a similar one dropping out of Poe's X-Wing. The Falcon escaping also transitions perfectly into Luke seeing a take off and yet yeah, just some really tight storytelling taking us from one character to the next. On Luke's X-Wing we can also catch the mocking ZZ which in the universe is Arabesh for RR. This could be related to the Rebels but so far no one's found out what it actually means but if you know then drop it below. Now the Falcon flies into space which is where we see it's pursued by a bunch of TIE fighters. Throughout the film 3PO's been constantly trying to tell Han the hyperdrive's not working which means they have to fly directly into an asteroid field. Now the failed jump comes with a stock sound effect of a plane starting up to which I'm sure they reused in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Watch this. Get lots of slapstick comedy with the tools smacking up Han's head which lets us know they're heading towards the asteroid. Really love how C-3PO gives the odds for survival as well and after doing it earlier this kind of becomes his catchphrase. Whenever I think of him he's giving the odds and yet yeah, I love the banter and dialogue between the whole crew here. Now the asteroid field pushed the creative team to the limit and they had to build a new version of the Falcon that could pull off these complex twists and turns. We watch as these manoeuvres cause the Star Destroyers to almost crash into each other and these almost appear like their teeth. Kind of feel like this foreshadows the space slug escape later on and how its jaws almost close around the ship. The asteroids themselves apparently had some that were made out of potatoes and even one of the VFX artists shoes are in there. Now we even get a moment where a TIE fighter flies directly into an asteroid and you can catch the pilot getting flung out into space. To me this is also where William's score really sings and it's probably one of my favourite pieces in this entire franchise. Now back on the Star Destroyer we see Vader's meditation chamber and get a brief glimpse at the back of his head. Apparently the sound effects for this use is an entire block of Alcatraz doors slamming shut and seeing Vader like this is another hint to the subtext. He and Luke are of course related and they're both shown to be scarred and inside of a white chamber. The atmosphere in here is altered which is why Vader can breathe without his helmet however he does have a small mask that we see being pulled up as we get the shot of his head. Such a funny detail happens here when we cut to an establishing shot of the asteroid field and can see a star destroyer being hit directly with one. We then jump to Vader talking to holograms of his admirals and can catch the guy to the left reacting to the impact before the transmission cuts off. Just a nice little bit of dark humour and it also shows how little Vader really gives a fuck about his underlings. Now Vader ends up moving out of the asteroid field to speak with the Emperor which is when we get one of the big special edition changes. Originally the Emperor was played by Marjorie Eaton with them superimposing chimpanzee eyes over her face. This was later referenced in Rise of Skywalker when we had a chimpanzee fixing Kylo's helmet with a visor over its eyes. Clive Revel provided the voice with the scene and dialogue later being updated to have Ian McDermott. Now there are some line changes here so it expands more on Luke and also him being the offspring of Anakin Skywalker. We have a new enemy, Luke Skywalker. We have a new enemy, the young rebel who destroyed the Death Star. I have no doubt this boy is the offspring of Anakin Skywalker. Now originally Anakin wasn't mentioned in name until Return of the Jedi with Obi-Wan's Force Ghost saying it for the first time. Really clunky, McClunky you could say and yeah I kind of prefer the way that they had it originally. Anyway on Dagobah R2 gets swallowed by a swamp creature which in the expanded lore is known as a Hagobad. This is actually an anagram of Dagobah and something else got altered in these scenes too. If you saw this movie in the theatres then you might remember Luke dropping a line about R2 not tasting very good. Yeah. You're lucky you don't taste very good. Yeah. You were lucky to get out of there. Now why this was changed is because when the movie was originally sent out different prints had slightly different sound mixes. When they made the special editions they ended up picking the one with the final line though personally I still prefer the original. 
Now Luke says that he feels there's something familiar about this place, and its strong connection to the Force likely gives his notion. He can also sense that they're being watched, showing how his connection to it has been improved. Luke then runs into Yoda, and Lucas has kept a lot of his species' backstory a mystery. I love how Yoda just plays about with him, and this is all done as a test to see if Luke has any patience. Luke fails by getting angry and frustrated, and this is when he reveals that he can't teach him. I cannot teach him. The boy has no patience. Yoda really embodies the teachings of the Jedi, which themselves were based around the Eastern ideologies of self-defense. Martial arts like karate and judo, you know, the key word with them is defense, because you're not meant to go on the attack and use them to bully people. This is why when we see Yoda's training, it mainly involves running and meditation, rather than going on the offensive and practicing sparring. Even the little floating droid that Luke practiced with in A New Hope, that was all about blocking, and it's rare that the Jedi are supposed to go on the attack. Now when we first cut to Yoda in his backpack, we can also see a winged creature known as a Dagbat. Luke questions whether the dark side is stronger because from what he's seen, evil makes things easier. However, like Yoda says, it's more difficult to master your feelings, and having power over this is where the true control lies. Yoda even says if Luke picks up his lightsaber in anger that it will drastically change the course of his entire life. That's definitely the case, and it actually reflects what happens when Luke goes into the cave. Luke was told to not take weapons with him, but doing this showed why he got what he got. As Yoda says, Only what you take with you. Now Luke went looking for a fight, and thus he found one. This somewhat foreshadows the ending as he purposely goes looking for a battle with Vader, and in the end, that's what he finds. The cave shows you your darkest thoughts, and that explains why Luke sees a vision of himself in the mask. Now, they actually tried to use a prosthetic head for this, but it looked too unrealistic when it was revealed. Thus, Hamill had to stick his head out the ground and then sit with a mask covering his face. However, this proved to be really difficult as he wasn't allowed to blink, even with all that smoke blowing in his face. Now, there's actually a hint that this Vader is fake, and we can hear that his breathing is slightly different. His lightsaber is also colored to be more orange looking, and this gives off the effect that it's more of a vision than reality. They purposely made this vision die in a similar way to Obi-Wan, which makes it seem like Luke's becoming more like his dad. Now, Luke's face inside Vader's helmet also highlights a connection between him and his dad, and it helps set up the theme of the next two movies, which is about the father and son relationship. Vader, of course, wants to make his son come over to the dark side, and the word Vader actually means father in Dutch, though it is pronounced differently. I also love how as Vader walks out the cave, we can see as the environment creates these slanted archways. Later on, when Luke fights him down the corridor in Bespin, we can also see the archways return to build off this moment. Now, the following scene is Luke trying to lift the X-Wing out the bog, and Frank Oz does so much with the puppeteer. Just the look of shock really carries across, and it's moments like this that embody the true power of a Jedi. I keep telling my wife that size matters not, and we see that in the case of Yoda lifting the ship. And the timeline of this is a bit all over the place, as the Falcon manages to get to Bespin without the use of a hyperdrive. People obviously wonder how long of a trip in space that is, but Lucasfilm have actually never nailed down how long it took. Alongside the training, it's thought to be about three days, so like I said, it's never been confirmed. Now Luke clearly hates all of his training, and yeah, maybe you should have taken the online course instead of going to the planet. He ignores both the warnings of Obi-Wan and Yoda, and decides to leave, which is when we get this clue about Leia. That boy is our last hope. No. There is another. Well, they actually somewhat reveal who this is subtly, as the next character we see after this line is actually Leia. They do some overly long shots of the X-Wing going to space, followed by some Cloud City moments, but the next time that we see someone, it is her in the window. Now, Luke has put this line in not only to allude to this, but he also wanted the audience to feel like Luke could actually die. Doing this might make us think they were going to replace him, which is a nice little way to raise tensions for the fight. Now in these establishing shots, in this special edition at least, we see a Tabana gas platform which mine it from the planet below. In Rogue Squadron they had a mission where you had to attack Imperial containers on these, and the gas in general plays into the fight at the end. The carbonite chamber is full of it, and this is actually what Luke sprays in Vader's face during their duel. Now Vader ends up calling in lots of bounty hunters, including characters like Bosk. His costume was actually grabbed from the archives of Doctor Who, with them then adding the lizard mask to top off the look. Fett, IG-88, and Dengar are also there as well, with the latter having a rivalry with Solo in the expanded lore. 
Nafet's voice was redubbed after Attack of the Clones to make it so that he sounded more like Timura Morrison. Looking back, I actually prefer the original. I don't know, watching it with Morrison, it, it does kind of take me out of it, even though I like the actor. You may take Captain Solo to Jabba the Hutt after I have Skywalker. He's no good to me dead. He's no good to me dead. What if he doesn't survive? He's worth a lot to me. What if he doesn't survive? He's worth a lot to me. Across space, we join the Millennium Falcon hiding out in a slug. Lots of clear allusions to Pinocchio in this, with the creature even appearing whale-like when we see it later on. 3PO talks to the Falcon, and in this movie you really get the feeling that it's its own character. It breaks down, chugs along, talks to the droid, and takes on a bit of a life of its own. Sir, I don't know where your ship learned to communicate, but it has the most peculiar dialect. Now this dialogue with the ship would later get expanded on in Solo, with L337 getting uploaded into it. Han and Leia have their first kiss to a bit of John Williams, which is then interrupted by C-3PO. Now on the outside of the asteroid, we watch as bombers sweep the area, which was a new tie design created for this film. This was actually based on the World War II German Voss BV-141 reconnaissance bomber, which had a dual fuselage to it that these also carry. Now this is of course coming from a World War II aesthetic, and the Stormtrooper blasters themselves are based on a Sterling L2A3 MK. Love this line by Han as well. Sir, if I may venture an opinion. I'm not really interested in your opinion, 3 p And after fighting Minox on the ship, Han realises they're inside the belly of the beast and they make a dash for it. The noise of Minox was actually created by playing a horse grunt and then reversing it, which you can kind of hear. Watch out! Now, these masks that they're wearing would later appear in the saga, with Ray and Finn using them in Force Away. I'm going to get so much shit for mentioning the sequels. But that's where, that's where the pop up again. Anyway, after they escape, we see the Falcon being chased by destroyers, and they pull off a desperate manoeuvre to get out of the situation. Hiding on the back of a Star Destroyer, this was a technique Lucas reused for Obi-Wan in the prequel trilogy. Retroactively, I think this was dropped into Attack of the Clones to show why Bobo was able to suss out the Falcon doing the same tactic down the line. Slave 1 appears in both of these films, with its colour scheme reflecting the armour of its owner in both instances. Now the crew fly out to Bespin after Han suggests it, with Chewbacca hinting at the history between him and Lando. This is expanded upon more in Solo, with us seeing how Han actually won the Falcon. Well, that was a long time ago, I'm sure he's forgotten about that. As we know, the character cheated, but he used Lando's tactics, so f fair is fair. Now they're also escorted in by cloud cars, which are atmospheric cars produced by Bespin Motors. Reddit user Xenomorphosaurus theorised that the Falcon was fired upon at first because Lando was actually trying to warn them off from it. The Empire would of course want them to land, so this aggressive tactic might be the only thing Lando could do. Now again, it's a few things up there, but yeah, let me know below exactly what you think. Now Cloud City actually builds off the back of a concept from the first film, with it originally being conceived as a prison above Alderaan. This is where Obi-Wan and Vader's duel was going to go down, but it was just all pushed into the Death Star for some economic storytelling. Now lots of this approach was redone for the special editions, with them also changing out the backgrounds so it showed more of the city. Greeted by Lando, I feel like this was the role that got Billy D that cult 45 career. Here we also meet a Zade Lobot who's got cybernetic parts placed over his head. In the movie this covers his entire ears, and ironically the actor John Hollis did something similar in the past. Hollis also played a Clydus Observer in Flash Gordon, but in that he had a cybernetic device over his eyes. The banter between the pair instantly comes through, and we get a sort of love triangle with Lando in the mix. Now in the scene where Lando takes Leia's hand, Han grabs it off him, and we get a little smile from Carrie Fisher. This moment of Han grabbing her was apparently improvised in the moment, which caught her off guard and caused her to break character. Not really break him, but you know what I mean, and the smile here seems genuine instead of being acted. Given a lush white penthouse, it's clear Lando is trying to win them around with comfort so that they stay longer for the Empire to put things in place. He even says to Leia, You're absolutely beautiful. You truly belong here with us among the clouds. Mm, thank you. Hinting at the pot of the deal of how they now have to remain prisoner there. Taking a dinner, they're immediately greeted by Vader, and I absolutely love the way the scene plays out. It shows just how quick to draw that Han is, whilst also cementing Vader's true strength. On vs Vader is a matchup that you'd never really think to see, and even watching it here, you can instantly see why. Even though he's one of the best characters in the saga, he's got no chance, and Vader just blocks his blaster bolts by lifting his hand. He's made you look a right knob. 
I've always kind of taken this as being akin to bullets bouncing off Superman, and it sets up the idea that Luke doesn't stand a chance. Now from this point, Han's interrogated or tortured due to them not really asking any questions. They never even asked me any questions. This is purely because Vader wanted to lure out Luke, and he knew doing this would give him visions of his friends suffering. There'd be absolutely no point in asking him anything, which is why he just tortures him instead of staying there chit-chatting. Now from here he's taken to be frozen, which is when Princess Leia says I love you. You probably already know this because you're, you're very far deep into a Star Wars video, but just in case you don't, here's what happened with Han's reply. There was a moment in it when Han Solo was about to be cast into a, a object later to be purchased by, <laughs> by Kurtzman and Horsey. <laughs> uh, <they, laughs> made into frozen into carbonite. And finally the princess reveals her great love for him and her line is, I love you. And George had artfully contrived for Han Solo to say, I love you too. Right. Not for you. Well, I thought it was a lost opportunity. Yes, yeah, sure. I mean, this character never behaved so unabashedly emotional and, mm -hmm. and conventional uh, before. And I thought, are we, pissing away this great opportunity for the for the character. You want your badasses to be a badass to yeah. the end. You right, want them right, to right. go down uh, the way they the way they lived. So I, I, I said, um, I mean, what's the last thing uh, a woman wants to hear when she says, I love you? <laughs> <laughs> she says, I love you. And I say, I know. Right. And so we shot. You shot one like that, right? Well, you, we what, shot one, you know, just yeah. for protection, where I spoke the line uh -huh. uh, as written. And George, I think that this is a fair enough to say he went ape shit. He uh -huh. thought it was horrible and that it would get a bad laugh. So I was obliged to sit next to him when he uh -huh. tested it for the first screening. There was a laugh, but it was a laugh of recognition. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Kind of ties back to him teasing her before. Come on, you want me to stay because of the way you feel about me. And something about the way he's dumped down, almost like a living death where he's become part of the coffin, it just sticks in your mind as a big point in this movie. Just the drool and the look of pain on his face frozen is something that's always been part of my memory. And every time I think back to this movie, this is one of the first things that pops up. It's almost like a frozen agony with this being such an impactful way to close out his arc in the film. This would later be riffed upon in Solo A Star Wars Story when the character falls in some mud and poses in a similar position. You also see a really subtle change in Lando here as he grabs his neck after Vader tells him he's altered the deal. Typically people do this when they feel vulnerable and it might show that the constant changes have now gone too far. Vader has also choked out multiple people in this movie too and it could be symbolically building off that to show how close he is to getting it done to him. Now this scene is also the only moment in the original trilogy where Vader and 3PO are on screen together. Watching the prequels and knowing what we know, I thought he would have been like, oh shit, is that 3PO? That's my boy! And after this moment, Luke sneaks through the location, which is where he sees Han's body being escorted through. As he draws his blaster, we see Fett turn his head, and this is because he actually hears the gun getting pulled out. This is why he goes back and starts shooting, and it's such a cool detail to show how aware he is. Funnily enough, Luke pulls his blaster out throughout the movie at several points, but he never actually fires it throughout the entire film. Now the battle between Luke and Vader is shot brilliantly, with this getting the two different sides almost in every aspect. Blue and red are the two key colours here, with both blades representing dark and light. This is carried across to the environment too, with the blue background clashing with the reddish glow of the stairs. The reddish glow can also be seen in Vader's Super Star Destroyer with the engines of it appearing the same colour at roughly the 22 minute mark. Vader fights with just one hand, exuding confidence and it's clear that he's just toying with his new Padawan. However after Luke tricks him he goes back to using two, showing that he slowly realises he needs to take the fight more seriously. The longer it goes on the tougher it gets with Vader even getting to the point that he just starts throwing stuff at him. He also disarms him which causes Luke to drop his blade and this disarming moves a trick that he does later on. However, Luke refuses to let go of it and the second time Vader disarms him by literally disarming him. Now after Luke falls down the stairs we get a little moment where we can actually see him looking above Vader's head. It's a very subtle glance but it telegraphs his next move which is to jump above him after he gets dropped in the pit. 
Now the shot of Luke pulling the lightsaber to his hand was actually achieved by Hamill just throwing it and then reversing the footage. Bit of a gaff in the carbonite chamber, but when it when it goes into his hand, if you slow it down yet, yeah, you can see it lighting before he actually grabs it. Nitpick, it's a nitpick, and Vader also taunts Luke about his training with Obi Wan. Obi Wan is taught you well. This is because he's unaware that Yoda was doing it, and he still thinks it's his previous master who was teaching him. Now later on, the pair get separated, and Vader actually hides from Luke down one of the corridors. Upon appearing, his breathing speeds up, and this is because the carrot has been holding his breath to not give away where he is. These corridors would again appear in Rey's vision in The Force Awakens, just before she discovered Luke's lightsaber, which gets lost shortly after this scene. Sending Luke out the window, we can see how far this fall was, as you can catch it in the top left when we cut to the establishing shot. When he's hanging, you can also see his lightsaber just sitting on the walkway, explaining how he managed to get it back after this fall. Now, while this is going on, Lando ends up helping the rebels escape, and we watch as he races after the Falcon with them. At the end, we see him wearing Han's clothes, and for years, I was like, whoa, that's, that's a bit fucking cold, mate. Now, but what the theory is, is that Lando left his home with just the clothes on his back, so he would have had to fish around in Han's stuff in order to get a change of them. Not like Han needed them, and I actually heard. They smell better on the inside. Now just before rushing through the corridors, R2 gets electrocuted on a power socket, and this moment was something that appeared in the original novelization for A New Hope. In the end, Lucas didn't end up using it, but he brought it across for this film after thinking it was a funny gag. Racing through the corridors, Lando runs past the character Will Row Hood, and we can see that he's carrying a container. It turns out, right, this is actually an ice cream maker, but it's something that's been actively now brought into the franchise as being a container that holds stuff. Popped up in Battlefront where he could get rewards from it, and the Klein also had one in The Mandalorian. Now cutting back to the fight, Luke actually gets first blood, and he manages to cut Vader's shoulder, which is when he realises that he has to wrap things up. Throughout the battle, he's just been toying with his son, but he finally realises the kid could beat him, and decides to end it there. Cutting off his hand, we then get the big talking point of this movie, with the twist being revealed that Vader's Luke's father. Spoiler alert. <laughs> now this was kept completely under wraps from everyone on set, except for Mark Hamill, who was actually told the reveal just moments before shooting. The line used on set was, No, Obi-Wan killed your father, with it then being dubbed over by James Earl Jones. David Prowse, he was a bit annoyed he got kept in the dark, because he said he'd have played it differently to make the body language more impactful. Hamill actually said that when he and Ford first watched the movie that he leaned over and said, Hey kid, you never fucking told me that. Now James Earl Jones was so sure that Vader was lying that he actually thought it wasn't true until he read the sequel script. I love how devastating this moment is even now, and everything about it is carried across perfectly. Even just the way the Imperial March changes to give it this more impactful feel, we, we slowly start to see as Luke realises it's true. No. I... Now this lines became discussed in a lot of collective false memory syndrome because most people swear it's Luke, I am your father. Even James Earl Jones said it, but yeah, no mention of Luke in the entire thing. Now another reason this whole thing's so painful to Luke is because he realises that Obi-Wan has lied to him. This was someone he looked up to and trusted, and now he really doesn't know what he should believe. Luke says, See ya chump. And throws himself into the chasm, showing that he'd rather face death than join with his dad. However, as he falls down, he goes into a shoot, which could have something extra going on with it. Now this is probably down to the force, but this viewing, I actually had a different theory. What if, right, Vader was someone who was actually guiding him, and this is because he wanted to save his son. They actually added in a screen for the special editions, but I think this has been removed in the latest updates. Also, lots of extra audio in this movie is just explaining certain things, because Lucas thought people were too stupid to get it, so they just spell it out in the special editions. Oh, this is suicide! Oh, this is suicide! There's nowhere to go! Either way, he reaches out to Leia, and for the special edition they added in an extra hatch on the Falcon to block out the white background. Now from this point we get what, in my personal opinion, is the, wor the worst change in the special editions. Not kidding you. But now Vader, in the original cut, he, he was furious. And this was so well reflected in James's slightly toned back, but still angry delivery. Bring my shuttle. 
It's just so badass. Bring my shuttle. But then, because Lucas was worried that audiences wouldn't understand that his shuttle and Star Destroyer were two different things, they changed it to this. And let my Star Destroyer to prepare for my arrival. Lucas, yeah, he felt he really had to underline it. And then we got added in shuttle shots where he, he flies up to the ship and then shots of him stepping off it. These were actually unused ones from Return of the Jedi, which were then used to help pad out the journey. Now reaching out to Leia, I love this shot of the Falcon turning around on the clouds and the TIE fighter chase turns what, what could have been a dull rescue scene into a really exciting one. The sun coming up behind the planet and the hyperdrive being broken it all just adds so much to it, and R2 saves the day, allowing them to jump. From here we get a shot from behind Vader's head, which echoes the way that he was introduced in the movie. Both scenes use the same framing, and it brings it full circle from that beginning. Guy's too lost in thought about his son to even kill Piet, even though he promised Vader they deactivated the hyperdrive. Did your men deactivate the hyperdrive on the Millennium Falcon? Yes my lord. Good. I love how after they jump, he just turns around and walks away and everyone's just kind of staring like, is he going to kick off? Honestly, there aren't really that many jokes in the film, but there's a lot of little humorous bits like this where I just laugh because everyone's so scared shitless of Ada. Kind of reminds me of when I drop an 11,000 word script on the editors and I'm like, you better fucking get this done in an hour's time, mate, or you're fucking dead. And at this point, we cut to the medical frigate with Luke getting a replacement hand put in place works too well and he even feels pain through it but it carries a special meaning with it as well. Vader is more man than machine and Luke is slowly starting to come closer to his father through the replacement of his limb. Though it is a little touch, it's him slowly stepping forwards towards the vision that he had in the cave. From here we cut to Luke and Leia looking out over the galaxy and a feeling that they have a long road ahead of them to go and get Han. Now this does sort of have a bit of sweet feeling to it and it's not as dour as it originally was. Hamel actually said they shot this moment four months after principal photography wrap because they wanted to add a slightly more hopeful ending to the movie. Now this would later go on to get echoed in Attack of the Clones where we close out with Anakin and Padme. Anakin has a mechanical hand and both he and Padme look out over the lake in a similar position to Luke and Leia. Either way, it closes out the movie, ending what's an incredible film. Impressive. Most impressive. It's hard to overstate how much of a hit it was, and even back in 1980, it grossed about 400 million at the box office. Adjusted for inflation, this is the equivalent to about 1.9 billion, which would make it one of the most successful movies of all time. Unfortunately, Lucas still had a bit of a rough time behind the scenes, and when making the film, there were constant spiraling costs. The bank threatened to pull the loan we talked about before, and Lucas was then left in a position where he had to again approach 20th Century Fox. They agreed to secure the loan but wanted a bigger cut and Lucas managed to do it without losing the sequel and merchandising rights. However, it still stuck as a sore point for him and because of this he took Raiders over to Paramount. This easily ended up with 20th Century possibly losing out on more in the long run and yeah, whether it was a good deal for them or not remains to be seen. Now Lucas still, well they're all owned by Disney now anyway. Now Lucas still benefited off this film massively though, and it's difficult to deny how much it changed cinema. Even as a kid, I remember this being a movie that really changed my perspective on stuff, because to me, yeah, the good guys, they were always meant to win. This flipped the script and dealt a devastating blow that a lot of franchises still try to mimic today. Still though, I feel the original's the best, and this is a masterpiece in movie making from start to finish. This is a film that took Star Wars from being a franchise with a fun film into a behemoth that altered how we look at movies. Arnie from the Now Playing podcast said a line that's always stuck with me and I think that it perfectly sums this movie up. When describing Empire, he said, this is the film that took Star Wars from a movie and then turned it into a religion. This is something, yeah, it sums it up for me and this was really the movie where I, I fell in love with the whole thing. I hope you've enjoyed watching the video and have fallen in love with us too and if you want to support videos like this then please click the join button. For 99 pence or 99 cents a month you can really make a major difference to the channel and help us continue working away on longer content like this instead of just having to jam out small videos. Really makes a massive difference and we try to release early videos for members whenever we can so you will get some bonuses so thank you for, for signing up to that. 
Now, if you want something else to watch, then make sure you check out our Brighton Avenue hub, which will be linked on screen right now. We've also covered 2001 A Space Odyssey, so whatever direction you want the galaxy to take you, we've got a video for you. Starship Troopers, that's going to be next. And with that out of the way, thank you for sticking through this. I've been Paul, and I'll see you next time. Take care. Peace.